Welcome to the European Parliament in Brussels for this new edition of Talking Europe. The EU so-called banking union was supposed to be up and running this year, but differences between Brussels, the European Central Bank and Germany over the way forward for the new banking authority have slowed progress to a crawl. Why does Europe badly need a banking union? I'll put this question to my guests in a moment. And in the second part of the program, I'll be joined by Kristalina Georgieva. She's the EU Commissioner for Humanitarian Aid, a native of Bulgaria. She will comment on the wave of pro-EU protests in Ukraine. Pablo Zalba, welcome to Talking Europe. You're a Spanish MEP. You're also the vice chair of the Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs. Now at home, you belong to the Partido Popular of Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy. Also on this set from Luxembourg, Frank Engel. Welcome to Talking Europe. Uh, you're also from the uh, European People's Party. That's the centre-right group here in the EP Parliament. Your country is one of the world's largest financial centres and therefore whatever happens in terms of banking union matters to Luxembourg. Now, of course, the, the need for a banking union became apparent in the wake of the financial crisis because the collapse of a number of European banks forced their home countries to seek EU bailout and led to credit crunch. Pablo Zalba, what is a banking union? Well, a banking union has three pillars. First of all, a single supervisor mechanism. This means that the European Bank, instead of being supervised by the national supervisors, in the case of Spain, for example, the Bank of Spain, are going to be, from November next year, supervised by the European Central Bank. The second pillar of the banking union is the single resolution mechanism. That is an authority and a fund to resolve uh, banks that cannot uh, survive. And finally, the third pillar of the banking union is the single deposit scheme, the same one from the European Union. The single supervision mechanism has been approved both in the Council and the, the European Parliament. We are now working on the second pillar, on the single resolution mechanism, and somehow there's an agreement to get it ready before the end of this term. And for the next term will come, will arise the debate on the, About on the, the third, third pillar. pillar. Now, as we understand, the aim, of course, is to have a more unified mm -hmm. set of rules and protections for Eurozone banks. Is it really necessary to have a banking union at this stage of the crisis? Well, be it at this stage of the crisis or be it uh, at some other stage, I believe that it's logical, that it's necessary um, to give a um, to give a, uh, an economic sector that is in need of regulation, that is regulated, that is also contained by a number of structures, um, and which operates across national borders and has been doing that for quite a long time, uh, also trans-border structures in order to contain and to regulate it. Um, we haven't gone far enough uh, in that yet. Uh, it's, always, it's always appeared strange to me that, talking about Luxembourg, we have over 150 banks of those 150 banks that we have, there is three or four that are Luxembourgish establishments. The rest uh, are dependencies of banks that are not Luxembourgish but that operate there. Um, I have never understood why uh, the different parts of the same bank would be submitted to totally different rules and, and, and structures depending on the country that they operate in within the same currency area. And therefore, the banking union makes perfect sense. What a lot of our viewers want to know is, had we had a banking union four years ago, would we have avoided most problems within the Eurozone? I don't know whether most or not, but probably we will have not coped with many of the problems we face. We created a monetary union, but we didn't create the economic union that usually follows a monetary union. This somehow creates a lack of governance in many governments, in many member states, who created many imbalances, too many imbalances, to who somehow has e had even questioned the euro as a currency. As uh, Pablo explained, uh, it would mean a great transfer of sovereignty towards, I guess, the European Central Bank, and some countries are dragging their feet. I'm thinking of Germany. Uh, the German government doesn't want to see the European Central Bank having too much of a role to play in this. Uh, there's a problem there. 
And it's, and it's sort of funny because the European Central Bank is already modelled on the German Bundesbank. Um, so uh, one would expect the Germans to trust uh, the spitting image of what they have at home, but still they don't. Um, which, uh, in my humble view, has to do a lot with the fact that the Germans always believe that they can do better than most. They will eventually have to come around to the fact that uh, it can only logically be the European Central Bank that does this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't see who else. And unless we give this authority to one European central structure, which can only be the ECB, we don't have a banking union. So it's, 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 it's either the full package or it's not much. Is there a problem with Germany? I don't think whether it's a problem of Germany or not. I think that obviously there have been some a little bit reluctant some, with some f specific issues, but I firmly believe that Germany at the end was sure that a banking union was needed. That was overall agreed by everyone. So, I mean, I think Germany is very keen on doing everything very uh, well, and I understand that uh, banking union is something you cannot set up in a few months. I think we are not aware we have not enough perspective to be aware of the big steps we are giving with the banking union. So I understand that uh, Germany somehow is reluctant and wants everything is very clear before any further step. One of the main goals of having a banking union, of course, is to restore credit lending, particularly in Europe's uh, financially crippled south. Will it work? I do hope so, but it will not work on its own. And it will certainly not work until um, we finally get to a, to, to a situation and to a solution where also the European Central Bank can assume the role that every central bank which is worthy of the name uh, assumes, and that is the lender of last resort. Because no banking union is going to take that responsibility away from a place which today we don't have. And therefore, uh, if, I, if I look at money in circulation in the South, I have the nagging feeling that uh, the banking union itself is not going to solve our problem. Yet another sign that the crisis is not completely over in the Eurozone, the Netherlands has become the latest member to be stripped of its AAA rating by Standard and Poor's. William Hildebrandt reports. And then there were three. When ratings agency Standard and Poor's downgraded the Netherlands one notch below AAA, it left just three out of 17 Eurozone countries, Finland, Germany and Luxembourg, with the gold standard rating from all three leading credit agencies. S&P said the Netherlands had disappointing growth prospects and was not performing as well as its peers, though the Dutch finance minister said upcoming reforms targeting the housing market, pension system and labor market will prevent any further downgrade. We're pushing forward a number of reforms to deal with some of the structural issues in our economy. Even though we're moving out of the crisis, we will have economic growth next year. It's still much too low. We have to uh, get higher figures in order to uh, become a triple, triple A country again, which is, of course, our ambition. It's a familiar sentiment around the EU. Hope the recovery has begun and that the crisis is in the rearview mirror, but recent data has only shown slight improvements. Unemployment in the Eurozone dipped for the first time since 2011. October's rate of 12.1 percent, though, was only a small drop. So while some EU officials are positive about the future, the bloc's economy grew just one-tenth of one percent in the third quarter, and ratings agencies warned more downgrades could be on the way. Frank Engel, Standard & Poor's cited weakening growth prospects for its decision to downgrade the Netherlands. The crisis is not over. Of course the crisis isn't over. I, uh, I wonder who can pretend that it is. Well, some do, as some, you know. Some, some, some do. EU some, leaders. Some, some, yeah, well, th th this, this is, this is uh, then what makes the term of leader so, uh, so uh, uh, disre disreputable. But at the same time, uh, I find it perfectly ridiculous, among many other things regarding r credit rating agencies, that insufficient growth pro uh, prospects would justify uh, a credit rating being taken away. Supposing that the Netherlands has sustainable debt, which is the only thing that counts, what the hell does a growth prospect really change in whether or not you assume that they can pay back? But the point is that these rating agencies have to continue justifying themselves, which they in fact pain to do because nobody really believes that we need them any longer and I would violently plead in favour of finally getting rid of them.
clearly in your country the crisis is not over but what's the feeling in, in Madrid and across Spain? Well, the feeling in Madrid is first, we are starting to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel, but we have to insist to go on working both at national level and European level. National level to go on working on reforms. I think we are uh, seeing some positive signals, for example, the unemployment drop in November for the first time since 1989. This is really a positive signal, but I insist we have to go on working on reforms, we have to go on working with fiscal consolidation, and at the European level we have to go on working at uh, uh, further integration, economic and political integration, we have to go on working in the banking uh, union, and I insist, what I said before, we have to look for solutions to credit, to flow, for SMEs and families, especially in southern countries. Without credit, it will be impossible to consolidate the recovery. And I think, and I go back to the beginning, we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, but we need to consolidate these positive signals. And a key EU summit will be held at the end of the month. We'll be following it to see whether decisions will or won't be made here in Brussels. But it's time now to welcome our new partner in the program. Joining us is Tim King from European Voice, publisher of a weekly newspaper on EU news. Tim. Welcome to uh, Talking Europe. Uh, European Voice provides independent insight into the Brussels Beltway. And starting this week, you'll be joining us to comment on what's been happening in Brussels. Looking at the week in Brussels, and it was a good week for two politicians, I believe. Yes, on, on, a, on a mixed verdict. We've been trying all week to work out what to make of the aftermath of the Eastern Partnership Summit and the European Union's relations with Ukraine. This time last week we were looking at an Eastern Partnership Summit that had ended in failure where a week ago the, the Ukrainian police were dragging demonstrators out of the, out of the uh, square. And as, the week, as this week went on we saw demonstrations in favour of the European Union and on balance what we decided was that all this was a good thing for Karl Bildt the Foreign Minister of Sweden, and Radek Sikorsky, the Foreign Minister of, of Poland. Poland. And those two are really have been the leaders in trying to promote the issue of relations with Europe's eastern neighbourhood, uh, up, up the European More Union's More than Germany agenda. or France, for instance. It was really Sweden, Poland and Lithuania who were it's, pushing for this it's deal with Ukraine. It's been partly personal and it's partly down to what countries they are. I mean, the, the importance of Ukraine to Poland is different from, from France's situation. But, it, but also, they put a lot of the legwork in before the summit. But they've also maintained the contacts. And that's a very important issue. Another interesting aspect, of course, is that we have to consider that Sikorsky probably wants to become the next EU High Representative for Foreign and Security Replacing policy. Catherine Ashton. Replacing Catherine Ashton at the end of next year. And and, and becoming a so member of the European Commission. trying to position himself, clearly. And then, like all ambitious politicians, he's trying to position himself and, and he's made, made some success in the last couple of weeks. Right. And it was a bad week for a number of countries and for a particular reason. It was a bad week for those countries that didn't score so well in the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD's tables on school performance of for 15 year olds the pisa ranking right? the pisa rankings performance of international student assessment right. or something so like that so who isn't doing well well amongst the european union people the the ones bumping at the along at the bottom of the class probably at the back of the class are uh, bulgaria cyprus and romania slightly different because it's assessed in for mathematics for science and for reading skills but basically those three are not doing well. Do we know the reason why they're doing so badly? Some of it is down to, is down to money and investment, and, and, but it's not all down to that. And one of the striking things, for instance, is Sweden, a, a country not the poorest in the no. European Union by any means, is actually their performance is below the OECD average. Luxembourg as well, below Luxembourg, the OECD indeed. average. Why is that? Um, <clears throat> look. If I were to be unnice to my countrymen, especially those in the sector, then I would say just having the most expensive education system on earth doesn't make it the best. It is one of the most expensive, 
statistics prove that. But at the same time, we're lacking quite a number of things that many bring down to the texture of the society, which is pretty multilingual. You know that we have 45% of immigration in the population, which doesn't uh -huh. make things any easier. Um, Getting lost in translation the, the when it comes system, to reading. <laughs> the education system, by necessity, has to be multilingual. But, but, on, not, but, on, but, but on the other hand, the Finnish system is as well. Yeah. 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 Not, not so much on, on, the, on, on, on the grounds of immigrants, but because they have a second official language. And Finland so scores so brilliantly. What about Spain? I know um, that Spain has well, invested a lot in education. Well, despite Spain is the not budget performing cuts. as well as it should be. And it's the same example in my opinion like uh, Frank, uh, like Luxembourg, that the more you invest doesn't mean the better results you obtain. So I think you have or we have in Europe to try to balance budgetary uh, policy in education but uh, making sure that this investment, not cost, investment give the results uh, okay. obtained. And the quality of course. Uh, one last thing Tim, what's your uh, leading story today in or this week I should say in the uh, European Voice? Well we're looking ahead to the to the European Council and of course one element in the European Council uh, will be the banking union. But I don't want to bring you back to the beginning of your program and get <laughs> you all around again. Yeah, yeah. Banking <laughs> union. So we'll leave it there on the banking union. Thank you very much to all of you, you. for taking part in this Pleasure. edition of Talking Europe. Please stay with me. I'll return just after the news break. I'll bring you an interview with Kristalina Georgieva. She's from Bulgaria uh, and she's the EU commissioner in charge of humanitarian aid.